All right, it's the uh, 8th of October, I think, and uh, we are going to continue on in our study of the, the kingdom of God, and uh, in particular, we're looking in Matthew chapter 13 at the kingdom of parables, um, and considering that there's virtually a whole chapter, a lengthy chapter at that, the book of Matthew, uh, dealing with uh, the kingdom of God, and it, that it is also, uh, in, in my opinion, one of the more misunderstood subjects of, uh, of uh, the New Testament. Uh, I think uh, it's good for us to take time and, and uh, go over these things so that uh, we have it in our minds uh, what the kingdom of God is and uh, not what some theologian or maybe even some denominational position is, instead just what the Bible says. And so, uh, let's go ahead and take our Bibles and uh, we'll turn to uh, Matthew 13 and read just a few verses today. We have already uh, considered the first two parables, and they are... What? So, seeing the sower is the first and the terrace is the second. Yep. And so now uh, we're going to look at uh, the third one. And uh, so let's read verses 31 and 32. I'll just go ahead and read these. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed which man took and sowed in his field which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge the branches thereof. And uh, so, let's consider what this means. The kingdom of heaven is like. It doesn't say, of course, that it is. It says that it's like it. Um, a mustard seed is not the kingdom of heaven, but there's an analogy that that can be made, and so there there's a lot of debate about the uh, parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven. And um, what 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 have you heard about these parables before? A lot of people like to compare the mustard seed to faith. Mm-hmm. They get that mixed up with. They want to add it to, if you have the faith to move mountains, they will smash those two. I think that is the case, that a lot of people do uh, compare it to faith, or maybe they even compare it to the growth of Christianity. Um, and uh, they're going to say that for both the uh, parable of the mustard seed, parable 11. And, uh, but... Is that really what it's saying? I think that it's important that, that we let Scripture interpret itself. And a lot of people don't do that. And frankly speaking, what a lot of people do is they look to somebody, they, they turn to John Calvin. This is what a lot of commentators do. And they see what John Calvin says, or they see what Martin Luther says or the Westminster Confession of Faith, what it says, and then they just, they just go with that. Uh, but we don't need to see what other men say. We can, we can see what, what others say, or what the Bible says in other places. And uh, so uh, the, the mustard seed, pretty much everybody recognized that among the herbs of the, the Middle East, the mustard seed. It's, it's not even like a seed we would normally think of. It's almost like powder, the mustard seed. And so it is, it's very small. And then the, t the parable says it's sown by the man. Now, the man, in, in the other two parables, represents who? In the seed and the sower. Here, the sower is the speaker. And Jesus Christ was the one talking. Yeah, I think the man symbolizes Jesus Christ. It's it's a type or, or 
you know, symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he sows the seeds in the field. And what does the field typically speak of? Um, as I told you last time, as I was a kid, we were taught about farming. So I did not finish because it's a long story, because it was a process of time of school time. For us, we were taught uh, the ground represents the hearts of men, and the seed represents the word of God, and the soul is God himself. It's like right now I'm your teacher, Christ was the teacher, as I'm teaching you, when you plant so in this In the parable, the seed and the sower, the different types of ground indicated the, the different type of receptiveness in, in, in people's hearts. But what I'm saying is, is generally speaking, in the whole Bible, what does the field or the ground or earth speak of as opposed to the sea? It's almost literally just the world, isn't it? The world. The world. But, but in the Bible, the earth or the land or the field speaks of Israel, and the sea speaks of Gentile nations. And so I think that we need to be consistent in that. And so, so the Lord uh, you know, took this something very small and he planted it in Israel. And so it all starts out there. And, uh, and then, uh, but then it grows into something uh, that normally uh, the mustard grows into a shrub about this big. It's it's uh, even among shrubs. It's not it's not that big. It's a it's a fairly small shrub. It doesn't become a tree, and it certainly did, doesn't become a tree that the fowls of the air lodge in. It doesn't say that they just land on it and you know for sit on it for a second or two because birds can land on a shrub, but they don't lodge in a shrub. They lodge. They build their nests in in a tree. Typically, and so, uh, and we know what the birds represent, right? Go back to verse number nineteen. So verse yeah. Uh, verse 18, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth that not, then cometh the wicked one, and catches the way that which was sown in his heart. This is that which was received by the, the wayside. So, when the seed was sown by the wayside, the fowls of the air came and, and ate it up. And so, the, the interpretation that the Lord Jesus gives is that the fowls represent Satan and... Uh, evil spirits and so the but what about what about the tree now I, I maintain that the tree uh, you know is something the mustard seed becoming a tree that's abnormal that's that's not what we would call extraordinary growth that's abnormal growth and uh, let's look at a few passages that can give us maybe a little bit of clarity on trees. Ezekiel 31. Uh, beginning at verse 1, And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the third month, the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh king of Egypt, to his multitude, whom art thou like in thy greatness? Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches. And we could go on and, and read about the cedars of the, uh, uh, the garden and so forth. Uh, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is compared to uh, a, a tree there. Look in uh, Daniel chapter 4. Just after Ezekiel, Daniel chapter 4. And uh, verse number 10. And these were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. And the tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto the heaven, and uh, the sight thereof to the end of the earth. The leaves were fair, the fruit thereof much, and it was meat for all the birds of the field, and the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof. And all flesh 
was fed up. And if you go on and, and read about this tree, you're going to find that it speaks about uh, evil kingdoms of men. And uh, so it, it seems that the trees typically in the Bible are used uh, to uh, add in comparison to, to evil kingdoms of men. And so uh, that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Christ started this all when, with his own sacrifice, and, and he was planted in the ground, and, and uh, then he was resurrected. But from that, not only have good things taken place, that is, you know, the gospel is preached, and people, are, people get saved, and churches are established, but Satan always uh, seeks to uh, make counterfeits of, of what God has done. Satan's not an originator, he's a counterfeiter. And so he, he counterfeits uh, what Christ has, has done and is starting his church, and now Satan's got churches. And so uh, that's what I think the, this, the kingdom is like that. When you consider, um, in almost every place in the world, the, the buildings that have crosses in front of them, that call them, you know, that have the name Christian on them, or, or from which Christ is ostensibly pre preached, are, are they are they of God? Is the beautiful gospel church of God? Because you know, if you read Cho Young Gi's book on you know his own autobiography, he said he got saved because he listened to the Beatles and he felt really good and he knew he was saved. That's his salvation testimony. And if you go to the largest church in, in the United States, Joel Olstein's church, uh, th there's no gospel preached there. In, 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 in Europe, you would go there and it's all of these mega cathedrals that, that you know, they've been building for a hundred or two hundred years and the amount of money that they spend in those things is extraordinary and yet they're 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 catholic uh, christ isn't preached there at all so i think that's what the kingdom of heaven is like is is we know that there's tares and there's wheat there's things that look like wheat but they're not really wheat and and they were planted by the enemy and that's that's what that's what uh, this. That's the interpretation. I, I think that is most consistent with the context, and uh, so uh, it's it's important to understand that because when you hear uh, so many sermons and, and read books, and very often people just you know they throw out the kind of standard interpretation. And I've got books by independent Baptists, and they just follow those standard interpretations. But but if you think about it. Uh, I don't think that those are very consistent, uh, you know, imitation or uh, I interpretations at all. And so, in 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 especially in the uh, parable of the seed and the sower and the parable of eleven, we're not learning what the kingdom of heaven should be like. We're learning the way that it is, and it is abnormal. It is not what it should be, and there's this. There's this pursuit of growth, but it is often based upon the pride and dominance and indifference, not people doing what the Lord Jesus did, people building uh, kingdoms. And so uh, I think that it's important to know these things and, and, and understand these things because a lot of, a lot of error gets gets preached when Bible texts are are misused. What do you any any questions or comments about that? We're studying in Matthew 13 and the kingdom parables and we read the parable of the uh, mustard seed. Look in the Revelation, I think we maybe see the conclusion of this in Revelation 17.
we'll read verses 1 through 6. And there came one of the seven uh, angels, which had seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And uh, the heads and the horns there, I think the, the, the horns represent individuals, the heads represent perhaps nations. And uh, the woman was arrayed in parlet, purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stone and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Upon her head was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots, Abomination of the Earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Not admiration in the sense of, of uh, you know, uh, liking it, but sim yeah, simply in awe or, or surprise. And... That if you look at, at at the history of Christianity, it did not take long after the time of the apostles before you know it started really with Constantine, and when Constantine uh, made Christianity the state religion, from that time instead of an a pagan uh, state persecuting Christian people. It was an apostate church persecuting Christian people, and it's going to culminate in the uh, in the one world religion that uh, the Bible describes as Mystery Babylon the Great, and I think that's what the, these parables are speaking of because they're they're going to have some Christian basis or you know appearance to them, and uh, so. Let's, uh, let's go on then and we'll look at the next parable, the parable of the leaven. The parable of the leaven, and uh, back in Matthew 13. And verse 33. Man, you came late, so you get to read that. <laughs> Matthew 13, 33, okay? Another parable spake he unto them, The king of heaven is like unto red leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. Yeah, so the kingdom of heaven, this one's almost surprising, isn't it? Because is in the Bible, can you show me one passage where leaven is portrayed in a positive way. Is there even one? Well, surprisingly, to the vast majority of Pro Protestant Bible interpreters, this passage right here is it. They'll say, yes, everywhere else in the Bible, leaven is, is evil, leaven is a corrupting influence, leaven, is, leaven speaks of sin, but right here it speaks of, of the power of God, the power of the church, the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, that's a pretty inconsistent way to interpret your Bible, if you ask me. Uh, I don't know too many other things in the Bible that we could say everywhere it is consistently used one way, but then right here it, it's in a different way. I know that, you know, the Bible is, declares uh, Satan to be like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour, and Jesus is the line of the tribe of Judah. And that's the justification that I've read that people say, no, leaven doesn't always have to be evil because, because Jesus is compared to a lion and, and Satan is compared to a lion. But they're misunderstanding the application because the lion in both cases is speaking of authority and power. One is evil, one is, one is, is, but is good. one is the lion, one is not. So, that's true, yeah, so he walks about as a roaring lion, he isn't, he isn't a lion, but so, so the, the leaven is, is, in the Bible it always speaks of corrupting influences, and uh, 
Well, let's just read a few of those uh, passages. And, uh, well, maybe before we look at the passages in the New Testament where uh, leaven is spoken of, in, in the Bible, do you know where the first uh, place where leaven and meal is? Not really leaven, but a meal. Uh, three, in fact, three measures of meal. Look in uh, Genesis 18. It's verse 6. And Abraham hastened into the tents unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And this was, of course, if you know Matthew, or I mean Genesis 18, excuse me, uh, then this is when Abraham and Sarah hosted the Lord and two angels. And so, uh, it's curious, that's the first mention of three meals, three measures of meal. And uh, it's consistent in, if, if you read the devotionals uh, that we did in Leviticus, you know that there was, there was kind of a standard order in which the offerings were done. First was a sin offering. The sin offering had to take place first. After the sin offering, there was a burnt offering. And that's, that's sacrifice. And then after that, there was a meal offering. So you, you had the sin atoned for first, then you had sacrifice, giving to the Lord. Then the meal offering spoke of fellowship. And so the meal offering was three measures of meal. And, and that's very consistent throughout the Bible, but it was always unleavened. It was unleavened. If the, if the three meals... Sometimes it was just three handfuls of meals. It was the ingredients to make three loaves of bread, and they were they were burnt uh, on the on the brazen altar. But sometimes the cakes were actually made, and then the, then the the a, a portion of it was burned, and then the priests ate the rest. But it was always unleavened. It was always unleavened. And uh, let's uh, look in uh, Matthew chapter sixteen. And verse 6. Brother John, can you read Matthew 16, 6? 16, 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So, uh, the Lord was concerned about the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That was legalism. You know, they're, they're thinking that they could be saved by keeping... Uh, the law, and uh, it was also a works-based righteousness, self-righteousness, and it was also uh, religious, outward religious, you know, where, where you try to look better by comparing yourself to somebody who, who is not as holy as you are. And no matter how unholy a person is, there's always somebody worse. Uh, but, you know, we don't usually point to the ones who are better than us, we, we, we'd rather point to the ones who are much worse than us. And so that was the leaven of the Pharisees. Uh, the leaven of the Sadducees was a little bit different. The Sadducees, they, they were the skeptics and the deniers. They, they denied angels. They denied resurrection. Um, and uh, they denied much of God's word. Generally, for the, the Sadducees, the only, the only part of the Bible that was authoritative for them uh, was the law. They didn't really pay any attention to the prophets or the writings. To, 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 they, only, they only cared about the law. And uh, they were the rationalists. They were the modernists. And uh, they also, Christ said, the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And uh, there's also uh, other leaven that, that was warned against. Look in Mark chapter 8. Verse 15, yes. Go ahead, Krista. 
In the caption saying, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Okay, I think we understand the leaven of the Pharisees. And it, probably we can understand the leaven of, uh, of the Sadducees. But what, what is the leaven of Herod? His way of living and the soul of evil. He was evil. The Pharisees, the, or the Pharisees, Herods were, 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 were evil, certainly. They were evil men. But why did, did they have a sort of general acceptance among Jewish people, even though they weren't Jewish themselves? Because they had adopted the Jewish religion. For the most part, they behaved as though they were faithful Jews. And so it's sort of a, a doctrine of compromise. Uh, and they, they compromised with the world because they worked under the authority of Rome. And uh, that they, it's a corruption of government power because that's what the Herods were. The Herods were the, the power in the land. And uh, they, they tried to control Christianity. I mean, Herod was the one who executed John the Baptist. And uh, another Herod stood by and basically added his voice to the condemnation of Christ. And so um, uh, that, that's also a leaven. you got the leaven of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and, and Herods. And, but even Paul uh, spoke about a leaven. Uh, look, look what he said in uh, 1 Corinthians 5. Verses 6 through 8. Your glorying is not good. You know that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And Galatians chapter 5 says basically the same thing. And so I don't know how anybody can come up with an interpretation about leaven being the woman takes three measures of meal and she leavens the whole lump. Um, and, and say that that has anything to do with the, the power of God or the spread of the gospel. Uh, and first of all, because it's not true. It's not even close to true. Even though there may be churches all over this city. And, you know, I remember the first time I came to Korea in 95 and uh, I got up in a, some, some higher place in the night and, and looked out and the crosses were all like red lit up and you could see red crosses everywhere across this this whole nightscape was was dotted with red crosses and it seemed like wow this is this has got to be the most Christian city in the world but is it because because I don't see it uh, it in fact I've had, I've had people, uh, when, when I did an English Bible study for a number of years at another church before I was pastor of this church, uh, I had a lady who was a member of Presbyterian Church, and she told me that, you know, all the deacons in her church, but they owned either bars or love motels, which were basically brothels. And that's what all the deacons in her church, they all, she said, had businesses that were, you know, nothing that a Christian person should ever be involved in in any way. And, uh, and I, I think that, uh, I think that, that just shows us that if there's something that's being corrupted or influenced, it's, it's 
the world is more influencing uh, Christianity for the negative than, than the other way around. And uh, that's, that seems to be what this parable is teaching. Any, any comments on that? Chris, you look like you're itching to say something. Oh, I think the other thing, though, is like there, there's no, like, we're saved into good works, right? And we should be doing something. When you're, the, you set the lemon aside and let the bread rise, you just kind of let the tree, especially an herb, just grow. So there, there's no work put into it. This is something that is occurring without the good influence of Christianity and the Bible in it. I agree. I think that the, the woman in the represents the church, and by the way, just, just so you know, uh, in the Greek language, when, when the word church or ecclesia is always used in the feminine gender, and so... Uh, yeah, because it's feminine, it's a feminine word. Even yeah, it's the bride of Christ, and, and so it makes sense, it makes sense. Um, but the leaven represents the corrupting influence introduced into the true worshiping communion of saints. And so, uh, God is the spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so, what is Satan going to try to do? He's going to try to corrupt that. And uh, so, uh, that those are the two parables that I think among all the, the parables are, are misunderstood. And I, I would say that uh, right here is after these first four parables, the parable of the seed and the sower, the parable of the, the wheat and the tares, the parable of the mustard seed, and the parable of the leaven, then notice what it says, says next um, in verse 34. Uh, all these things spake Jesus unto the multitudes in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. And then Jesus sent the multitude away, went into the house, and his disciples came unto him and said, Declare unto us the parable of the tares in the field. So the Lord had interpreted the parable of the seed and the sower to the multitude. But all the rest, the other interpretation, the interpretation of the seed and the sower was not given to the multitude, it was only given to the disciples in the house. Before that, he had been teaching in a boat in the sea. And now he's going into the house on the land. And so I think that there's a clear distinction. And after that, he's going to give a three, some would say four more parables. There's the parable of of the uh, hid treasure, the pearl of great price, and the the net, the you know, um, and then some say that there's a parable of the householder there. I don't really consider that a parable. Um, so, but but there's certainly there's there's truth there and some things to be learned from it. And so next week we're going to be we'll look at those final uh, parables, the the parable of the of the hid treasure, the pearl of great price, and the, and the, the net, uh, but I think I think that if you compare scripture with scripture, you really can't come to any other conclusion but that those two parables are speaking about yes, an expansive growth, but not necessarily.